Seven. I'm Rachel Minor. Uh, I'm a member of the ARU Little History Group, which uh, we are helping the Cambridge Commons in bringing you these talks. So, what's this series about? Well, my life as a social policy lecturer here at ARU, it's about preparing the future community workers and activists um, to understand the pervasiveness of social inequality its complexity, and to understand how four decades of neoliberal policies have made that inequality so much worse. Cambridge is one of the most unequal cities in this country. Gender inequalities are sustained by, among many things, unequal pay. The gender pay gap here at Anglia Rusk University is 11.9%. This statistic doesn't even begin to tell the stories of low pay and poverty for black minority ethnic women, working class women, and migrant women. So we, the underpaid residents of this city, we use our voices and our talents and our energy uh, to try and right this wrong. Because more equality makes life better for everyone. Tonight's event is part of a series and, as usual, covers one strand in a complex web of issues that together reinforce and fuel social inequality, as is actually experienced today. So, so far we've had uh, George Monbiot telling us how to revive political participation, uh, Danny Dawling covered fixing education, and soon we'll be having Herman Hauser to look at how technology and innovation make us more, not less equal. And later we'll be discussing reforms to taxation, housing and land ownership, and so on. No one of these domains alone is key to solving social inequality. But by engaging with experts uh, in these domains, new ideas emerge. By combining these ideas, a new vision for a more equal society emerges. So it's an exceptionally good idea to come to all these talks. Our wonderful speaker today uh, connects into the vision for a future of uh, social equality because gender, race and social class are powerful strands shaping the oppression and inequality of many people. Historically, feminism has been too white, too middle class and too heterosexual. Third wave feminism sought to challenge the core arguments and interests which devalued or maligned the experiences particularly of black women. Feminism is vital to achieving a fairer and more equal country in 10 years time and the feminism of today and for the future must be intersectional. Uh, in a sense, the whole of Imagine 2027 is intersectional. So, uh, some quick admin points. Uh, if a fire alarm goes off, it is for real. Uh, so there are exits to the left and the right, uh, and then go left again, then assemble on the road. Uh, this is the Wi-Fi passcode, and um, please use the hashtag which is up here. Please do tweet away because, you know, the first rule of Imagine 2027 is the more people know about it, the better. Um, we are recording today, so um, if you have any concerns about that, please contact anyone for any one of these badges. Um, and we'll be having a Q&A after this. And um, if you want to ask a question, please wait to have a microphone. Finally, uh, to our chair, David Howarth, uh, he was a city councillor here for 17 years, MP for five years, and he's now Professor of Law Public Policy at Cambridge University. Uh, David will introduce Ava and chair the discussion. David. Great, well thanks. Um, it's good to be here again and see new faces and some familiar faces. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Ava Vidal in about 50 seconds because you really want to hear her, not me. Um, she's best known as <coughs> doing stand-up all over the world. Uh, she also works as a journalist and a writer and a commentator on social political issues. Um, in fact, tonight's topic, uh, intersectional feminism, uh, she wrote about a couple of years ago in the Daily Telegraph, which tells you something, which is that it's not only in stand-up where she's willing to take on the audience. <laughs> she, um, the other thing I, I found very interesting about the background was that she started to write comedy when she was studying law, which I must recommend to my students. <laughs> um, and in fact, she's carried on with, with uh, some legal interests. And one of the things she's been doing 
he's putting on workshops for uh, the Stop and Search Legal Project, of which he's also a patron. Now, the one fact that everyone mentions about Anna is that in her early 20s, she worked as a prison officer. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the future, which is that she's drawing upon that experience in her first novel, which is called Pour on Water, and it's published, badly published by Unbound. There's an extract online, and of course, it starts in a prison. So um, I'm sure that um, all of her experiences will add up to everything she's going to say tonight, and it's a great privilege to introduce Anna. tonight, I really appreciate it. It's um, sort of a bit like when you do Edinburgh Festival, you're always terrified there's going to be no one there. Um, which has happened to me a couple of times. It was quite funny actually, I remember when it happened to me, I was like, oh my god, no one came to my show. It's really early in my career. And uh, so this comedian turns around and goes, uh, so what happened? I went, well, I just left, I didn't do a show because there was no one there. And he started screaming at me, going, you should have done it anyway. He's going to practice for your future. <laughs> How do you see my future? <laughs> Loads of gigs with nobody attending. Um, this is how... Do you know I don't think this is in a good place? I'm sorry, because I think it's too hard to keep getting a... Uh... I'm sticking there. Gosh, that's coming down. Right. Okay, you can still hear me, okay? Tonight we're here to talk about intersectional feminism. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a phrase that you guys have heard. It's been a concept that has existed for quite a while, but it was actually, the phrase itself was coined by American feminist Kimberly Crenshaw. And she basically just put a name to it. And the textbook definition states that the view that women experience oppression in, various, in varying configurations and varying degrees of intensity. Cultural patterns of oppression are not only interrelated, but are bound together and influenced by the intersectional systems of society. Examples of this include race, gender, class, ability, and ethnicity. In other words, certain, women have, certain groups of women have multi-layered facets in life that they have to deal with. So there is no one-size-fits-all feminism. For example, I'm a black woman. Anyway, right. And um, as a result, I face both racism and sexism as I navigate around everyday life. Um, I firmly believe that we are now at the point where feminism is going to stagnate if we do not acknowledge the concept of intersectionality. The way that it's going, we cannot possibly move forward. And um, even though, like I said, intersectionality has been around for quite a few years, um, it's only really been entered the mainstream in the past couple of years or so. And I don't think it's that people didn't know what it was. I think that it's that people stubbornly refused to sort of acknowledge uh, intersectionality in a bid to a fear of losing their standing in society. So I think um, before we look forward to 2027 and intersectional feminism, we have to look at the sorry state of feminism today. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> say so this modern feminism, bring your kid to work. <laughs> um, I believe that uh, quite a few of the, one of the main reasons that feminism, intersectional feminism has been pushed into the mainstream is a lot to do with social media. Because social media is allowing voices that have previously been marginalised and usurped and spoken over and, you know, just dismissed entirely, it's allowing them to have the ability to say what's affecting them. And it's also allowing these people to challenge um, the mainstream feminists, the writers, the stalwarts, the gatekeepers, basically. And to be honest, the uh, reaction has not always been good. There tends to be a habit of uh, 
mainstream feminists, especially if they're challenged by black women, women of colour generally, to say that we're bullies. Um, and a lot of people have also said sort of mainstream feminists try to resist intersectional feminism because they say, look, we can't deal with race at the moment. What we're going to do is we'll just deal with sexism on its own and then we'll come back to race afterwards, which actually doesn't work because, you know, we, like I said, I intersect on both. And I remember an example of this was uh, having a discussion about Chris Brown with, with uh, a white feminist and um, she then went on to call him a black bastard. To which I was like, excuse me? And she would go, well, you know, he did this. So we actually got into an argument about this. Why I said, sure, you know, I don't think I forgot my skin today. Can you, can you see me? Like, what would make you think that that would be an acceptable thing to say? But she goes, well, you know, he, he's, he's guilty of domestic violence. And I was accused of supporting domestic violence when I was trying to explain that I face racism and sexism. So obviously, I'm not going to support a comment like that. Um, and I was also asked uh, once, which I found really weird, uh, which are you first? Are you black first? <laughs> or are you a woman first? <laughs> reaction to me, um, it depends on them seeing both simultaneously. Um, as a black woman, there's always an assumption that I'm angry, I have no feelings, I have superhuman strength. Um, there was a black feminist years ago who was a slave and she was called Sojourn of Truth and she had a speech which I wanted to look up saying, ain't I a woman? Because black women were not regarded as, as women and that is because of the intersection with racism as well, because in order to keep slaves and to keep your conscience clear, they had, there was an a, a assumption that black people weren't fully human, so we were deemed as three-fifths human, and that way you could justify treating us like animals. And this has gone on till today, and you can see it in places like medicine. People don't assume there's going to be racism in medicine, but there is. There's a lot of assumptions it's been proven that black children uh, black people in general get less painkillers because the doctors assume that we can withstand more pain. Um, a lot of times, we, it's bad enough as a woman, full stop, actually, when you go to the doctor to try and say something's wrong with you. Women of all races tend to get believed less. They believe that we're making it up. They believe that we're hysterical. And then when you add the other layer of race on top of it, they believe that, oh, you know, uh, you can deal with it. I mean, there was a child a, a woman who told me that her child uh, had an operation in the hospital but afterwards the doctor was boasting that he gave that child less painkiller and she was going why and he goes look he could stand it and she was like really upset about it and um when i was having my last daughter and screaming hysterically um no because they forced me to have a blooming uh, what are they called yeah right you know, because uh, I had a, so I had a C-section before with my my 18-year-old son, but that was so long ago that they used to knock you out for that, which I wanted again. Um, <laughs> but they don't do that anymore, right? So they said to me that I had to have an epidural, um, which involved having a massive needle. I'm terrified of needles, absolutely terrified. And the guy was going to me, well. Because I'm really disappointed. You're not acting like a black woman, are you? I was like, well, what's that supposed to mean? Because I thought you'd be stronger than this. Like, dude, you're about to put a needle that big in my stomach. I am so sorry, but I can't, you know, it was horrible. Um, and so I. Why is it? I believe that uh, white feminism, as they call it. Now, can I just state this, okay? Because. I think a lot of people get very defensive when they hear the phrase white feminism because there is the assumption when you're talking about white feminism that you're talking about white women only. Um, that's not true and perhaps there should be a, another way of, of describing it perhaps. Maybe it should just be called mainstream feminism 
because I believe it puts a barrier up and it makes people defensive and I believe it sort of, you know, halts the conversations. Um, because I don't think that you have to be white to uphold main, mainstream feminism. There are lots of women who are seen in the public eye who uphold, you know, the values of mainstream feminism who are not white. Um, <coughs> pretty to tell. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, uh, so I think what shall we call mainstream fe feminism um, has historically refused to acknowledge the systematic hurdles facing women of colour who are not visible. Um, and that's why I think we need to take situations like what happened in the USA recently um, seriously. We need to talk about it. We do need to, to point out the fact that uh, Donald Trump got 53% of the white women's votes. 53%. And the thing that I found flabbergasting about this whole thing was that during the election campaign, he never really made it a secret that he didn't have respect for women. Um, he, he, he made it very clear he didn't have respect for people of colour and he had no respect for people of certain religious backgrounds. But unfortunately, there were some people so eager to defend their whiteness, they ignored most of the um, controversial comments that he's made about women. There's obviously the famous pussy grabbing comment. Um, he also called breastfeeding women disgusting. He told New York Times columnist Gail Collins that she had the face of a dog. He um, speculated that Fox News host Megyn Kelly had blood coming out of her wherever. And that's just the start of it. And all through his campaign, there was actually no clear intention to address the issues of equal pay, abortion, paid family leave, childcare, or the sexual harassment that he's been accused of by multiple women. Donald Trump has surrounded himself with men who are anti-abortion, men who promised and have uh, come through with that promise to defund Prime Parenthood. You cannot forget the um, image of him signing the executive order surrounded by a group of old white men. So, there were so many alarm bells ringing that I can't understand how any woman who has any pride or dignity at all would have voted for this man in the first place. And then there were the great big women's marches and there were women wearing pink pussy hats and all of this stuff. But I don't think there was an honest conversation. There needs to be an honest conversation had amongst all women, even women who voted for him or women who support conservative or Republican politicians like this, to ask them why. Um, why they think that that's acceptable and why they're so willing to throw other women under the bus like that. Um, I think that, as I mentioned, as a black woman, I have to face racism and sexism, and it puts me in a defensive position for both. But I think often with white women, they are facing sexism, but I think often they defend white supremacy, um, which is, is being called sometimes by some people the white woman's double burden um, of, you know, obviously wanting to have their rights. Uh, Alice Walker spoke about, um, she coined the phrase womanism in the end because she actually said that, that she didn't feel that black women had any part in feminism because it wasn't addressing our issues. And she actually said she had believed that white women had wanted to be um, equal to their fathers and their brothers, but they weren't really that keen on supporting us because they felt that we would be holding them back. And that could be seen um, when it came to getting the vote in the USA. They were, they were considered it, they put it on the table and said, well, we want the women to vote. If we can get black women to vote as well, then you know we could get push more women's issues through. But then they decided against it because they decided it was just too complicated trying to get black people's votes, so they should just move on without us. Um, there was similar arguments given in the suffragette movement uh, that people don't run don't actually know about. I know that Mum wrote Berghoff, um, people were quite upset with her when she said that the suffragette movement was a white supremacist movement. Mm. Um, there weren't that many people of colour around to be fair, but there were some. And their, their, you know, their objections weren't really heard.
I think that um, a good example of this, a good recent example of what I call the white woman's double burden, um, came about recently. And that this case kind of brings in uh, quite a few of the issues that I've been speaking about so far. Um, and that was with Mary Beard. Ah, oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I got quite a lot. I, it was me, it was a Cambridge lecturer, and I think there's a couple of other black women online that got, um, we got quite a lot of grief about this. But Mary Beard had said, um, speaking about the Oxfam workers, she had said she wondered, okay, let me just tell you a bit of background about that in case you don't know. Um, it, it came out that Oxfam workers in Haiti had been um, basically, you know, the language that you want to use to describe this kind of depends on, on a lot of these factors. So let me just use the language that was used in the mainstream media. They said that they were employing sex workers and they were um, basically children over there that were exchanging uh, sexual favours for things like mobile phones and sweets and stuff like that. So Mary Beard just decided to go on Twitter and say, hey, I've never been to Haiti. I would never go there. But what I think is, I wonder how hard it is to sustain civilized values like that in a disaster zone. Um, there's so much wrong with that, which we tried to point out to her. First of all, I don't know why you wouldn't go to Haiti in the first place. Haiti is actually pretty cool. Um, it's a really nice place. And it's, yes, they have been through quite a lot. And I think there is a big, uh, we have to address the reason why Haiti is seen like that in the world. Haiti was the first country in the world to, uh, the inhabitants were the first to refuse to be slaves. They absolutely, they had slave revolt after slave revolt after slave revolt, and they were not having it. Um, they sent so many armies to fight them, and they just, in the end, they had to agree just to leave them alone. Haiti has been punished horrifically ever since that. Haiti still paid taxes to France for the um, privilege of being free. And there are a lot of, um, the French are particularly harsh when they colonise. I don't know if anyone's ever been out to the Caribbean, but if you go out to places that had, have French rule compared to the places that have British rule, um, you can see the massive difference. <coughs> so after, uh, in 2015, I was, in the island, I was on the island of Dominica and we were hit by tropical storm Erica and I ended up going over to Martinique to try and get back over here because um, I was actually pregnant. Oh, I was going to say with Hannah, but she's gone. Um, so, <laughs> I was pregnant at the time, so I needed to come back to England. Um, and when I went to Martinique, I honestly, I had to keep doing a double take because I didn't even feel like I was in the Caribbean anymore. Um, there's islands in the Caribbean where French own, like the Saints and stuff, where there are no black people, or black people are actually in the minority. And every single part of that island that you go to, you can feel the influence of the French. They have built it like it's mini France, like the roads, everything, even the cuisine isn't, isn't Caribbean anymore. Um, and that is what's happened with Haiti as well, and also places in Africa. And so what the French do is when they have colonized somebody, even if they're independent afterwards, France still has a great uh, stronghold on them. Because you have to look at France. I mean, France has got a lot of money, but France doesn't have anything. It doesn't have any minerals, it doesn't have oil, it doesn't have anything, not to my knowledge, it doesn't have anything. Its money comes from colonising other people, and even when they get their independence, they have to um, adhere to strict rules. So, for example, if um, an ex-French colony wants to go into a business deal with another country, they have to offer that deal to France first. And if France say they want it, France will decide how much they're going to pay for it. And then if France decide that they don't want it and it can go to another country, they have to pay taxes on what they receive to France. So we can't look at Haiti without looking through the lens of colonialism and the history and slavery. Um, so for Mary Beard to, to say that, what she said about how hard it is to sustain civilised values in a disaster zone, 
Also, she's assuming that the men that go there, which are white men, who, who uh, because Oxfam and stuff don't tend to, to, to employ many minority people. They're very few. I know quite a few minority people who have tried to get jobs within NGOs who have not been allowed. Um, one woman, <coughs> when this was all going on, tweeted at me and said she went for a job with Oxfam and she was a black woman. They told her no because if the people saw her giving out aid, they'd be confused and they'd feel that she betrayed them by being on the other side so that they'd be more comfortable. And then you have to bring in that, you know, white man's burden, save, white saviour complex, all of these things, all of these intersecting layers are um, what brought this, this idea to Mary Beard's head that she could just say that out loud. And I don't even mind that she said that out loud. Well, tweeted it. But um, it's the fact that the absolute refusal to listen was what bothered me. Because at the end of the day, when people were trying to point stuff out to her, she then turned into and did that typical thing where she started to cry and she actually posted a picture of herself crying. Right? And um, there's an expression white tears or white women's tears and stuff like that. And it is something that I've noticed. And it was quite funny because somebody tweeted to me because I tweeted about it before and said, oh my God, it's true, it actually happened. But I, um, I actually realised that's a class thing as well because I don't see working class white women tweeting pictures of themselves crying or, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know, I've seen them in clubs in Newcastle, puking, <laughs> 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 No coat in the cold, holding each other's hair back. <laughs> I remember once I did a comedy gig up there, and there was this girl, she was in the toilet, and she was holding her friend's hair back. She's like, chuck it up so you can drink some more. <laughs> Those women do not tweet pictures of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, also, the fact that she said she hadn't been there, and she was unwilling to listen to people who had. Now, the reason this, this talk has been postponed is because I was actually in Dominica, um, when, well, I wasn't actually back, but I had just been to Dominica, half of my family in Dominica, and last year um, the hurricane season was absolutely brutal in the Caribbean, and it smashed up um, a few of the, like Barbuda was just gone, Dominica was practically gone, and <coughs> Dominica was in a really bad way because it's independent, um, and it's also not tied to anything else. So even though Barbuda was smashed to pieces, they had Antigua where the people could go to. Dominica didn't have any of that. And obviously sitting there and watching it, I became extremely depressed and distressed about what was going on. So I did some fundraising and I went over there. Um, and the situation was very similar to the situation in Haiti after the earthquake. And the point I was trying to make was that if you do go over there, as an NGO worker or whatever, the, the idea that, first of all, they don't live in rough conditions at all. Okay, so whatever happens is when they have like a five-star hotel or they have the best accommodation, they get given it. They get given a Land Rover to drive. They are very, very well protected and they are paid to be over there. And for me, I mean, when I said that I was going over, I started getting a lot of messages from people going, can you come to this person, can you come to that person? I mainly went over to help women and children because what I realised after, I travel to the Caribbean quite a lot because I like to keep those ties alive and also, um, you know, I'm going to see how it is over there and keep in touch with my culture and also you can, said they'd buy tickets. So I was checking stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> myself as a strong woman. So what you're talking about is women over there who are already extremely disadvantaged. I'll give you some statistics um, from the NGOs in the area that back it up. Um, there were studies for Antigua and Barbuda, Guyana, British Virgin Islands, Haiti, and that suggests that between 20 and 69% of women in intimate relationships have already been victims of domestic violence. 42.8% of young women and young girls, and we're talking about just in the Eastern Caribbean, not the whole of the Caribbean, this is according to UNICEF, 42.8% of young women and girls say that their first sexual experience was forced. Um, they've also estimated 
that 11,000 children below the age of 15 in the Eastern Caribbean alone live with HIV and AIDS. And this is mainly due to the fact that child abuse and incest is rampant in the region. This is a region where the top three rape rates in the world occurs. So we're talking about Virgin Islands, Jamaica and Bahamas, and all Caribbean countries have a higher rape rate than the global average. So you're talking about men that are going into a situation where women are already marginalized, women are already abused, women already are attacked, and they think the best thing that they can find to do is to add to their misery and to, to rape these women. That's the language that I would use, because as far as I'm concerned, there's a complete power imbalance. You're coming over there, you're going to these people, you're dangling stuff in front of their face. And I think we are persevered trying to explain this to people, despite the fact of being extremely insulted about it. And I was trying to say, okay, maybe what we could do for you to have a better understanding about it is you could compare and contrast the different language used when it came to the Haiti uh, situation compared to the Rotherham situation. Because when we speak about the Rotherham situation, we never ever, we never question the, the motives of the men. There's no sympathy for the motives of men, First, which there should not be. There should not be. First of all, like I said, there's no mention of the fact that the, the Oxfam workers are white men, but there's always, always mention that the, what happens in Rotherham is Pakistani, Muslim men, is constant. So what we have to look at here, uh, when you have an attitude such as Mary Beard, and she was backed up by a lot of mainstream feminist writers, I think Deborah Jane Orr had said that we are, uh, she's been bullied by an emotional bunch. Um, they can't, you know, it's, well, I didn't really read it, it's nonsense, but it was just, you know, it was a criticism like, oh, if only these women could control themselves, control their emotions and look at this object objectively. And Kathy Newman had written that, oh, you know, they're bullying her, they're bullying her off, uh, off Twitter, it's not fair. And, but then a couple of nights later, she was on Channel 4 News speaking about the Rodham thing and pushing the fact, oh, it's Muslim men, it's Muslim men. I think what happens is, when you are from a certain background, people believe that if you do something bad, it's because something happened to you. But when you're from a minority background, people think if you do something bad, it's inherent in your culture and it's inherent in your 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 ways, you know. I, I would never, the stuff that they said, that's the equivalent of me saying something like, wow man, I hear Rotherham's well rough, never been there, would never go there. But, you know, I wonder what it is about that area that makes Pakistani men break. That's the equivalent, and that's when I had to put it like that, that's when people went, oh, okay, I get it now. I understand what you're trying to say. It's absolutely unacceptable. The fact of the matter is, it's patriarchy that's the problem. It isn't within a race at all. Because I would like to know if I'm wrong, but I have not heard of one female Oxfam worker ever raping anybody. So we have to say that the problem is men. Sorry, guys. But the, it is, it's, it's not. It's patriarchy. And as soon as we can get that and stop making excuses for certain groups of men over certain groups of others, I mean, we see it all the time. We see it with terrorism. We see a guy yesterday who was sending bombs to black families, and he killed, he blew himself up. There's no suicide bomber. What's wrong with Christian white people? There's none of that. There's no one going, oh my gosh, we need to examine that. So we need to be honest. And I think if we are going to move forward and hopefully in 2027 be in a better place, we need to start looking at what the, the, the issues in common are with all of these situations. Sorry. Um, I um, have seen examples of this. What really makes me laugh? Uh, no, it doesn't make me laugh. What really frustrates me, so it's not funny is um, that 
people, certain groups of women get shocked. <coughs> this is really annoying, sorry. It's not too disturbing us. There's a feedback. People seem so upset. Like, when you, okay, what's the best way of phrasing this? Um, I don't know. It, it's, it's summed up in that poem, isn't it? And then they came for you. And I'm seeing that a lot within the feminist movement. There have been people, public figures, who have been so terrible to certain groups of women. And then when they turn on another group of women, they get really upset and go, wow. Like um, when Katie Hopkins... <laughs> this is on YouTube, so it's worth watching. What's that? Give him Katie Hopkins. Oh, that's ridiculous. Um, I'll just tell you the story quickly. Okay, so I did do Katie Hopkins' show. Can I explain what happened? This is. What's that now? Projector. Oh, is everyone hot in here? No, it's just that thing. It's, it's the projector. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. We just want our corporate message back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how I ended up doing Katie's Hopkins show, Katie Hopkins show, is actually tied back to um, what I was talking about before. I was actually in Dominica and I was pregnant, and um, we'd just been hit by Storm Erica. And I got a call from my agent saying to me, would I like to come and do Katie Hopkins' show? So I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> then they said to, I said, look, I'm stuck out here in the Caribbean. I'm really stuck. I can't get out here. I'm pregnant. There is no food. There is no water. So I said, tell them I'll do the show if she pays for me to come home. Oh. Um, which she did. <laughs> and so that's how I ended up on that show. So I had to go from Dominica to Martinique, then they flew me to France. And then um, the only thing about Martinique that's in common with the rest of the Caribbean is everything's late. So my flight was seven hours late. So by the time I got to Paris, I'd missed my flight to England. So they had to put me onto the Eurostar, and then I got to King's Cross and went to Borenwood. And that's why I ended up on a stupid show. And um, so Katie Hopkins is somebody, and to be honest, <coughs> If I had realised, I had been away for a few months, if I had realised, she wasn't even as bad then, if I had realised the direction she was going to go in and how bad she was going to get, I swear to God, I would never, ever have done it. Because I think that the direction that she's gone in is absolutely inexcusable. And she has been getting worse and worse. Um, she's just been saying disgusting things for quite a few years, but she really, she, she's gone, she's just gone now. And she had said, um, she said things over the years, like dismissive things, um, but nothing too, too bad. Because I'd worked with her a couple of times before on these certain debate shows. Okay, so they have, there was a series of debate shows on Channel 5. I know, I should have known. And uh, so I remember getting a call, I did one on benefits, which was just awful. And then I did one, they invited me to do one on immigration, and I, I said, I don't want to do it. And then they offered me money, so I said, okay. And then they, um, they, they said, I said, look, really, I said, immigration, it, it's not something that you should be treating lightly. Like, we are coming up to an election, this is a really tense subject, this could cause a lot of problems for a lot of people. And they said, Abba, we totally understand, we realised the benefits debate went, it was awful. So what we've done now is we've basically, we've, um, we're going to treat this subject with the reverence it deserves. And when I got there, I saw how much reverence they thought it deserved, because Katie was there. <laughs> so back then, she was, like I said, she was a bit calmer. And she actually used to pretend, she used to pretend that she was a decent person. And um, so she'd be in the dressing room, milling about, trying to make friends with everybody, offering people cups of tea and stuff. And she really, at that point, was acting like, Everything she does is just a performance. So she was, um, so she'd be, she'd pretend to be normal. And then um, when the camera went on her, she'd just come out with stuff like, you're like, where did that come from? You know what I mean? What are you on about? So she started coming out with this retro racism that I haven't even, I hadn't heard for years, basically. Some real Al Garnet back in the day classic racism. Mm -hmm. Um, so she was saying stuff like, send them back, send them all back, send them way back. <laughs> what has happened to you? <laughs> and then after she went into the dressing room, it was quite funny actually, because after the show they had like cars with our names in the window and you take the car and you go. 
So she ran, she got her stuff, and she ran out, because there was lots of black and brown people in there. And uh, <laughs> she runs over to this cab, she runs over to look for her cab, and it wasn't there. So she came back to uh, the dressing room, she went, uh, uh, someone stole my cab. And I went, no one stole it, Katie, it was driven by an immigrant, he fucked off. <laughs> <laughs> So, so for years and years, she's been saying some really disgusting things, like she talks about women um, wearing a niqab, calling them pillar boxes. Um, she started talking about Black Lives Matter, going, oh, why are these uh, black women out there crying uh, about their children being killed by the police? What's the point? They just kill each other anyway. And, and she started getting progressively worse. And it was only when she started saying stuff about... Uh, Ched Evans, mm. Ched Evans, that certain women started waking up going, this woman's not so nice. <laughs> so I remember this woman had said, um, I said something about it, and a woman tweeted at me and she went, oh, you know, I really used to agree with a lot of what Katie said, but she's gone too far with this. I was like, well, at which point did you agree with her? When she was chucking Muslim women under the bus, when she was chucking black women under the bus, when she was chucking lesbian women under the bus, so at which point did you fit, you only started to notice it when it became about you? And we've seen this as well um, recently, in the last, sorry, in the last couple of days, um, we have seen <coughs> this happen um, with Jermaine Greer. Um, and this, this is a current story, and if you guys are on Twitter, if you are, when you go, go and look up what Melanie Phillips is doing online today. Go and look at what she is saying to rape victims. Now, for quite a few years, women of colour and trans women have been trying to point these women out to you and say these are not, you know, these women have some very dodgy views. But it's only now. Um, now, Jermaine Greer, now I don't know how you guys feel about this, but this is a subject I'm going to speak about. As far as I am concerned, trans women, not as far as I'm concerned, but the fact is trans women are women, okay? And gender is not as simple as we thought it is. And I can't, you're going to need to bring a trans woman to speak about the biology of it, or a trans guy. I don't know the biology of it. But I do know that trans women are women, okay? Nobody puts themselves through that for the fun of it. And I think it is really unfair, and I think as feminists, I'm really disappointed in the amount of feminists that have their voices amplified on a regular basis <coughs> that are chucking trans women under the bus. And what I have noticed is that trans women, it tends to be trans women first, then it becomes black women, or, and, or, and Muslim women, and of course they're black Muslim women, and then, when, then they start saying some very dodgy things about rape victims in general, then that's when people go, hold on a second, Jermaine Greer has been pretty bad for years. Um, and she actually said, um, basically, she said she had all, when it comes to sexual abuse and harassment, she always wants to see women react immediately. In the old days, she said, there were movies, the Carry On comedies, for example, which always had a man leering after women, and the woman always outwitted him. He was a fool. We weren't afraid of him, and we weren't afraid to slap him down. Now, if your point of reference on how to behave <laughs> when you're sexually abused is a carry-on movie, perhaps you're not qualified to talk about it. What, I mean, there's so many different instances where this is just absolute nonsense. I mean, what about younger women who are sexually abused, who have no voice? Who, what about women who are abused by people in power? What about women who have no other way of feeding their families, who are taken advantage of? So to say that we should all act like we're in a carry-on film and slap the guy around the face and run off double speed to Benny Hill music is just absolute and utter nonsense. And I think, um, like I said, if, you know, when it comes to black women, black women in the past being raped by slave owners couldn't just slap them and you say, oh, well, I'm not having that. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Melanie Phillips took it a, a stage further and she actually agreed and she said that um, these movie stars involved in the Me Too movement were actually received money for being ra raped. I mean, <coughs> why on earth would you even think that? She's referring to the fact that some women have accepted payouts. 
I don't know if anybody's had to go through a court case um, where you've had to speak about something like that um, that's happened to you. I had to do this in, in the Caribbean of all places, which is why I started sort of looking into it a bit more. And I was absolutely outraged at the way that women were treated over there. I took this thing to court, um, I took my ex to court for domestic violence, and it was just a big joke. They were just laughing in the courtroom, they thought it was really funny, um, he was making up outrageous lies about me, they just thought it was, it, you know, they just thought it was really funny, the way that the, the judge was laughing at me, I was trying to show evidence, and I thought, my God, I just want to go back to England, and I thought, well, what about the women who can't go back to England? I showed them texts from this guy where this guy was saying, if you don't buy me a house and some land, I'm going to completely mess up your career with the British media and I'm going to sell stories about you. And I was just like, this guy is really overestimating the level of my success. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so ridiculous. It was so horrible. And, and so when you hear somebody who's never been in that situation say, oh, this is what you should do. I mean, sometimes women suppress that for years and years and years, and as we're now finding out, so do, so do men a lot of the time. Men are abused, but this whole patriarchal system that we have at the moment, it just, it even, it inhibits men, and it prevents men from speaking out as well. Um, so I think that, why I would say, with, with trans women, and I think there's a lot of misinformation um, around at the moment about trans women, and there was that stunt that was called, um, was it last week or week before, where these women who were protesting um, the proposed changes to the Gender Re Recognition Act decided that they were going to self-identify as men and go to a men's swimming, uh, you know, session, a, a public pool. What people don't understand about the Gender Recognition Act, okay, there's this, so much misinformation about it, and there's this idea that under the proposed changes, that you can just change your gender willy-nilly as you like. That is not actually true, okay? Um, there's been an argument saying there's nothing to stop men from using a false gender identity to gain access to spaces where women are vulnerable, like changing rooms and bathrooms, which is what this, these women did when they went to this all-swimming, all-male swimming class. Um, it's not actually true. The, it, theoretically, there may be possible to identify for a gender for one day, but actually it would not be. It, you could do that now, but if we brought in the Gender Recognition Act, you actually couldn't do that. There's um, five other countries in the world that have brought in similar uh, legislation to the ones that we're proposing that we bring in um, for self-identification. That is Argentina, Denmark, Norway, Malta and Ireland. And when you talk about the fear of some man entering um, into a change room. First of all, in those countries where they've got Gender Recognition Act, this just hasn't happened. It hasn't happened, so it's kind of fear-mongering. Fear and we should be looking at the verifiable facts. And actually, what the Gender Recognition Act would say is that if you are caught in a space where you're not supposed to be, um, you, you can be arrested and you can be fined. At the moment, you can't be. So actually, the Gender Recognition Act would defend, would protect more women than us not having it. And you can also be stopped. You can also, um, if somebody sees a, uh, who somebody who they assume is male, presenting male, to coming into a women's changing room, you can stop and ask them for ID. You can stop and ask them for evidence. So actually, and at the moment you can't do that, which is, um, which is ridiculous. So I think rather than us having these hysterical conversations about what might be and how scary that is, I think we need to sit down together, all women, and have these conversations without scaremongering, without threatening, without swearing, and I think that would lead to a better 2027. Um, I was asked to make this speech positive and full of hope by the organisers. And um, <laughs> they've clearly never seen me before. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. What are my dreams for 2027? Well, I have a dream. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Might have even got away with it. Um, 
what would I say? Imagine 2027. 20, I'd say, imagine there's no heaven. <laughs> I don't. No, I, I do believe. I believe that we will. I think that we will have these difficult conversations, and I believe as certain spaces open up, that we will. Um, there will be more balance, definitely. Um, I believe that mainstream feminists are going to have to give up some of their power because they're just going to become irrelevant as time goes on. And as Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. I think we're on the fighting part at the moment. Um, I probably shouldn't have quoted him because he's quite racist. Um, but, um, <laughs> um, so, I hope for 2027, um, what I really hope, I hope there's stuff, I hope there's no more, I think there's no more clothes for each gender. If we got rid of that, that would help a lot. That would really help a lot. And I spoke to trans people about that. I've got a few trans friends who told me, because I am such a awful pet, like my daughter's always in pink, got a bright pink coat and a bright <laughs> pink push chair and stuff like that. But it was pointed out to me that actually, it, it when you dress your children according to those gender stereotypes, it actually does make life harder for everybody else. So that's something that I'm working on. Um, other thing that I'm working on is, is trying to listen. Listen more and maybe... I really don't like having my tone policed. Um, and I can be quite brutal. So I, I'm, for me, for, for my hopes that I'm trying to... to be more considerate in the language that I use when I speak to people um, about these things. Be a bit more patient. It can be very annoying being asked a lot of questions and being asked to educate people all the time. Um, but, you know, if we want to move forward, I think that's what we have to do. Um, the other thing I hope for 2027 is that black women should rule the world. <laughs> because, uh, I saw black pants on it, look cool. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, all the, uh, the, the topics that I brought up today, I think if we address those and we work on those and we communicate, um, we can. We can, we can have a better 2027. Thank you.